Top Gun is the most expensive advertisement ever made. Okay, well technically this two minute Chanel ad that Baz Luhrmann directed with Nicole Kidman and the hot guy from Love Actually is the most expensive advertisement ever made. But with a 15 million dollar budget adjusted for inflation, Top Gun comes in as a close second place, just like Maverick himself. It's no secret that the US military actively supported the production of the movie, giving the filmmakers access to everything from military bases and F-14 fighter jets, right through to letting them film on the deck of an aircraft carrier. Top Gun went on to become the biggest movie of 1986. It made Tom Cruise a global superstar, revitalized the sport of volleyball, saw Ray-Ban sales skyrocket, and it launched a legendary soundtrack that, in a lot of ways, is even more popular and well-known than the film itself. Oh, and it also led to a 500% increase in aviator applications in the US Navy. Top Gun was the most expensive advertisement ever made. And it worked. Other movies had had support from the military, but no other movie popularized and romanticized the life of a soldier or the image of the military in quite the same way as Top Gun. Hollywood has a long and well-documented relationship with the US military, and for the most part, this relationship has been mutually beneficial. Hollywood gets to use cool fighter jets, tanks, locations, and ships, and the US military gets to cast itself and its soldiers in a positive light, project some soft power into the world by showing off their hard power assets, and maybe even get some people watching to think, hey, I could do that. I wanna fly jets, sir! My grandmama wants to fly jets. The military support for the movie industry is sometimes called the military entertainment complex, and although Top Gun might be the most famous example of it, it was definitely not the first. In fact, the partnership goes back almost to the very beginning of modern cinema. 59 years before Top Gun rode in on its mighty wings to box office glory, the first ever Best Picture Oscar went to the movie Wings. It's the movie that has this quite famous shot from it, but when it's not tracking the camera through a cafe, it's about two pilots fighting against Germany with a romantic subplot. Oh, and can I just take a second here to point out how awesome it is that in just under a hundred years, filmmaking has gone from this to this. Anyway, the producers of Wings specifically hired William Wellman for it because he was the only director in Hollywood at the time who had previously served as a combat pilot. Through his military connections, Wellman was able to attract support for the production from the US War Department, known today as the Pentagon. Planes and hundreds of soldiers were lent to the production, as well as technical advisors who worked with Wellman on the film. The movie was a huge critical and commercial success due in no small part to the accuracy and detail in the military sequences that simply would not have been possible using the filmmaking technology of the time had the War Department not lent their support and equipment. Sounds familiar, right? Now, people have written entire books on how the relationship between the military and the movie industry evolved during and after World War II, but we're here to talk about Top Gun, so let's fast forward a few decades into the 1980s. By this time, the relationship between Hollywood and the military had evolved into a very transactional one. The military wants to look good in movies, and the movies want to look good by having real military stuff on screen. But real military stuff is expensive, and the more expensive a movie is, the bigger the risk to the studio. So studios are constantly on the lookout for anything that will make the production cheaper. That's why product placement exists. The scene calls for people to be drinking beer? Okay, well let's ask all the beer companies who will pay us the most to put their product in the scene. It's always Heineken, by the way. The movie goes ahead anyway, but the studio gets a nice paycheck to offset the budget with. But what if you want something more expensive than a beer in your scene? What if you want, say, a $38 million fighter jet? Well, this is the 1980s, so you can't just make one with CGI. You could use models like Star Wars did. That could work, but it might be less convincing against a real life backdrop rather than space. You couldn't do a shot like this with a model using 1980s filmmaking technology. It had to be a real plane. So you could buy or rent a bunch of older retired fighter planes and hire people to fly them. But that sounds really expensive and possibly dangerous. Besides, think of the logistics. Where are you going to store the planes? Where are they going to take off and land from? Who is going to maintain them? And what do you do with them when you're done filming? If only the military would be kind enough to let us put a film crew on the deck of one of their aircraft carriers for a day or two rather than, you know, buying an aircraft carrier. Well, this is exactly what happened with Top Gun and dozens or possibly hundreds of other movies. 
It's hard to actually find an exact number of movies made with Defence Department support. See, while movies like Top Gun and Transformers are very openly made with the full collaboration of the Pentagon, sometimes it's more subtle. Like, sometimes the military's involvement in a movie can be as simple as fact-checking a screenplay to make sure the right terminology is being used, or asking them to make sure that characters' uniforms are accurate. The military will often be consulted, formally or informally, on details like this without necessarily having the expectation of changing the script or influencing the production. But the more involvement they have, the more control they want. After all, millions of dollars can be shaved off a film's budget if they agree to lend their support. But to get that support, the filmmakers have to submit the script to the Pentagon for approval. And if the military is going to offer the levels of support that they did for a movie like Top Gun, the producers have to agree to make any script changes requested by the Pentagon and pre-screen the final cut to them before it's released. And sometimes the studios don't agree with the changes requested by the military. For example, they were going to lend a hand with Independence Day, but the Department of Defense not only wanted them to remove references to Area 51, but also felt that the military appears impotent and or inept. All advances in stopping the aliens are the result of actions by civilians. So support was withheld because the filmmakers felt that the changes being demanded by the military to address these points would fundamentally alter the movie too much. But sometimes it's the opposite way around. Guillermo del Toro refused the help of the military for Pacific Rim because he didn't want his movie to become a recruitment piece for the army. So yes, plenty of movies that featured the US military were made without their direct involvement or approval when, for whatever reason, the filmmakers decided that the story they wanted to tell was not compatible with the changes the military wanted them to make. Hell, even Crimson Tide, another great Tony Scott military movie produced by Bruckheimer and Simpson, was made without the US Navy's help because they didn't like the idea of telling the story of a mutiny. But a movie like Top Gun simply could not be made in 1986 without using the military's bases, jets, and ships. The military was happy to oblige, but they took their red pen to the script. First the change was any reference to a specific country or territory as the enemy. Pay attention to the dialogue and you'll see it's carefully worded to never make it clear who the bad guys are. They do this in Maverick too, by the way. America wasn't officially at war with anyone at the time Top Gun was being made, and with the memory of Vietnam still fresh in the minds of the American public, they didn't want to go causing any unnecessary international incidents. So the opening scene was rewritten to be set in international waters, instead of Cuba, where it was set in the original screenplay. They also changed the opening scene so that Cougar still lands his plane and survives. Originally it was supposed to crash onto the deck of the aircraft carrier. Oh, by the way, do you notice that no American pilot dies in Top Gun except for Goose? And the film is at pains to establish that this was an unavoidable accident. I mean, at the end of the movie, when these two guys are shot down, the movie even makes a point of showing them rescued safe and sound. Rescued by the military, of course. But the biggest change from the original script was the character of Charlie. In the original screenplay, she was supposed to be an enlisted member of the Navy, but since the Navy forbids officers and enlisted personnel from uh, taking each other's breath away, Charlie was changed to be a civilian contractor, because God forbid a movie that's literally about a maverick who's known for breaking the rules would, you know, break the rules. Anyway, these are the major changes to the script that we know about. Everything was locked and loaded and they were ready to start filming the most expensive advertisement ever made. Now at this point I should really clarify that I really like Top Gun and I think it's a genuinely good story with well written characters who have interesting and compelling relationships. The reason the action scenes work as well as they do is because the movie makes us care what is happening to these characters. So I am aware that calling it an advertisement could be seen to diminish the filmmaking. But the fact that it's a great movie doesn't change the fact that the Navy lent a huge amount of support to the production of the film with the intention that it would improve their image. It can be both of these things at the same time and pointing out one doesn't negate the other. I'm glad we got that straight. So yes, Top Gun is a great movie with a great story that also ends up being a 110 minute long commercial for how awesome it would be to be a fighter pilot, which is exactly what the Navy wanted it to be. The producers even hired the late great Tony Scott to direct it, and up until this point he had pretty much only directed commercials like this one for Saab. On the set of Top Gun was Rear Admiral Pete Pettigrew. No, not that Pete Pettigrew. No, he's the guy in the bar that Charlie sits with after talking to Maverick. Pettigrew was a Vietnam veteran and former Top Gun instructor. He served as the military's technical advisor on the film. They even named a character after him. Pettigrew's job was to keep things as accurate as possible, while also keeping an eye on things to make sure they lined up with what the Navy wanted. Sometimes literally, I mean, this shot isn't framed this way by accident. 
The crew were given access to military bases for the shooting. While the school scenes were filmed at the Miramar Air Force Base in San Diego, most of the dogfighting scenes were filmed around Naval Air Station Fallon in Nevada. The Navy made a handful of jets from the Screaming Eagles F-14 squadron available to the production, and the company that manufactured the jets was even commissioned to build a special camera that could be mounted on the aircraft. The Navy even helped get Tom Cruise on board. He was reluctant to sign on to the movie at first, so the producers asked the military to take him out for a spin in a fighter jet. They took him up in a, in a Blue Angels airplane, an A-4. The first time I did, I took, pulled out that barf bag and ripped one off and, you know. I mean, he threw up over everything, but when he landed on the ground, besides being dizzy, he called me up and said, I'm doing the movie. By the way, this experience is actually what started Tom Cruise's love of flying. Anyway, much more expensive than the military bases were the scenes on the USS Enterprise. No, not that USS Enterprise. Now, most of these shots were just shots of the ship's crew going about their daily tasks. But to get shots like the flyby or emergency landing, Tony Scott had to request them specifically. And these requests didn't come cheap. Even though the Navy was supporting the production of Top Gun, the support was through access to the equipment, not funding. Like the military still had a job to do, and while they were happy to oblige the filmmakers, they're not just going to bear those extra costs. For example, adjusted for inflation, it costs about $20,000 an hour to fly the F-14s outside of their normal duties. So the studio is often the one paying the military for the running costs of the equipment. There's actually a famous story from the making of Top Gun about this. They were filming on deck and the ship changed course, which changed the lighting. I got my first idea to call it to the captain of the ship and say, please, can you continue on the coordinate you just on? He said, nope. So I said, what does it cost for this aircraft carrier? to run per minute. They went and got my checkbook, I pulled it up on a rope, signed a $25,000 check, sent it back down, gave it to the captain, he turned the ship around and we got the shot. So yes, the military equipment exists and is being used anyway, but if it is ever being used specifically for the movie, then the movie studio needs to pay for that extra use. But it is still way cheaper than any other alternative, so the studios are happy to foot the bill and the military are happy to reap the benefits. Top Gun is the most expensive advertisement ever made. And it worked. Top Gun came to define the image of fighter pilots in the popular imagination. There was a 500% increase in interest in becoming a pilot. The Navy even set up recruitment booths right outside movie theaters, hoping to entice impressionable young men into signing up on the spot. They ran recruitment adverts before the movie, and even their future adverts were basically carbon copies of the opening scene. Top Gun was a defining moment of popular culture, and the military has been cashing in on its popularity ever since it was made. Just before the release of Maverick, a US Naval Air Force spokesperson even said that if you talk to a lot of the senior pilots in the Navy today, their captains and admirals, many of them attribute their interest in naval aviation today to the original release of that film. So of course with Top Gun Maverick, they're trying to do the same thing. Tie an adverts showing off the real Top Gun pilots, promoting the film at naval bases with service staff present, and running a recruitment campaign in the pre-roll adverts. The military will be hoping that Top Gun Maverick delivers another recruitment boom, which is why they pulled out all the stops to help them make the movie. Director Joseph Kaczynski, who by the way also made his name directing advertisements, even said that because all of the top brass in the military who helped them out when they were making Maverick had been in their 20s when the original came out, they let us do all this crazy stuff. For example, the Navy usually bans people from flying below 200 feet during training, but made an exception for Top Gun and flew just 50 feet from the ground. In this shot, the force of the jet taking off was so strong that it destroyed the set. They only got one take. As a pure movie experience, Top Gun Maverick was absolutely phenomenal, and like its predecessor, much of that brilliance came from the authenticity that comes from doing things in camera for real. These shots are real. The actors aren't in a green screen cabin. They're in a real jet being flown by a Navy pilot. The film crew spent an entire year working with the Navy to install IMAX cameras inside the cockpit in a way that wouldn't compromise the safety of the aircraft. And it was worth it. As Kaczynski said, you can feel the authenticity, the strain, the g-forces, the speed, something you could never capture on a soundstage no matter how much money or visual effects you threw at it. The jets are real, the stunts are real, the landscapes are real, and you can tell. And it would not be the same if it had been done without the military being involved with Hollywood. Now whether or not you think this relationship between the military and the movies is a good thing or not probably depends a lot on your opinion of the military. I'm sure you'll tell me in the comments. But Top Gun is probably the most famous example of this military entertainment complex. 
And whatever you might think of the deals that went on behind the scenes to make Top Gun Maverick come to life, you can't deny that the end result is an absolutely spectacular motion picture unlike anything you've ever seen before.